Are you familiar with the saying that a system is only as good as its weakest component? Or maybe you've heard it said this way, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And this holds true for lots of things in life. I mean, take a home theater sound system, for example. You can have the most amazing amplifier that pumps out 10,000 watts per channel of the purest sound possible, but if you hook it up to some cheap little one-inch speaker, it's not going to sound very good, and that little speaker is going to blow up. It's football season, so in football, can you have... You can have the best quarterback that has ever played the game with the biggest offensive line in the league who can hold back any defense for as long as the quarterback wants. But if the receiver that the quarterback is throwing passes to can't catch the ball, then that team's passing game is in big trouble. Or say... Daryl and John build a hot rod. <laughs> and they put an amazing custom-built engine in that hot rod that pumps out 900 horsepower. But they bolt onto that amazing engine the transmission from a Nissan Sentra. <laughs> what happens? They'll be lucky to get that car backed out of the driveway. That engine will be so powerful that it will rip that transmission apart the first time they rev the engine. If I tried to use the chain that was shown in the picture a moment ago to pull a large heavy object, like Daryl and John's hot rod, which now has a destroyed transmission, what would happen? The chain would break right where that paper clip has been used as a link. Well, this same idea is also true when we're talking about spiritual things, and in particular when we're talking about our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, and becoming like Jesus in character, and having eternal life in heaven, and all of the rest that comes with salvation. Our salvation is only as strong as the weakest link. So there are really two ways of going with this. One way is for ourself to be one of the links in our salvation chain. This is the essential idea in virtually every religious system that has ever existed except one. And in this kind of system, what or who is the weak link which causes the entire thing to ultimately fail? You and me. We're the weak link. If you and I are part of our salvation chain, then our chain is going to break. Our salvation is not going to happen. Now, the other way to go is to not have ourselves in the salvation chain at all so that there are no weak links. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, biblical Christianity. We're beginning a new Bible study series today through the letter of Galatians. And this issue of the weak link in our salvation is something that the letter of Galatians addresses. The letter to the Galatians, often referred to simply as Galatians, is one of the most exciting documents in the Bible because it declares that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the complete solution to the human condition. Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ saves a person, removing the guilt of their sin before God, giving them eternal life in heaven, and it is the mechanism for transforming a person's life to be like Jesus. There's nothing else needed other than faith in Jesus Christ for a person to receive and experience the new life that God wants to give us. We're not told in Galatians that we need to work harder at being better people in order to win God's approval. Instead, we're told that we need to fully embrace and live out the implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, who were the Galatians, and what was the reason for the Apostle Paul writing this letter to them? 
The Galatians were a group of churches in the area of Galatia, which is in present-day Turkey. Paul had preached in the cities and towns of this region and founded churches there during his first missionary journey, this described in the book of Acts, chapters 13 and 14. Paul wrote this letter to address the erroneous teaching that had begun to find its way into these churches. Now briefly, the false teachers were coming in and telling the people in these churches that are coming to faith in Christ that they then needed to begin to practice the Jewish religious rites, such as being circumcised, in order, in order to be completely and truly saved, to receive God's blessing in this life and eternal life in the next. These false teachers were also attacking Paul's credibility. They said that he was not a real apostle and that what he taught was incomplete, that he had just cobbled together a teaching for Gentiles that was popular and easy, but it's inadequate. Well, to confront and to refute these false teachers, Paul presents and defends his credentials as an apostle of Jesus Christ in chapters 1 and 2. Then in chapters 3 and 4, he presents the case that all believers, both Jewish and Gentile, have complete salvation through Christ alone. And then in chapters 5 and 6, he closes the letter saying that this gospel of grace, rather than it leading to unrestrained immoral lives, instead leads to true freedom and godly living. Rather than imposing a moral code on a person from the outside, which then tries to conform them to a particular ideal, the gospel of Jesus Christ gets at the root of the problem, literally. A person who comes to faith in Christ is brought to life spiritually. This person is given a new nature. A new relationship with God is established, and the and God the Holy Spirit lives in that person. The fruit produced in the life of a person who has come into this new relationship with God and has the transforming Holy Spirit in them is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are qualities of the new nature that God brings to life, that God brings to life in the person, and he nurtures and grows in them. See, the gospel is not behavior modification. The gospel is person transformation by God. Well, let's flip to Galatians chapter 1. It's over in the New Testament. If you've not found your way there yet, I haven't found my way there yet. So busy talking. Galatians chapter 1, and beginning in the first verse, says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Paul's opening words of this letter are unique among his letters to churches in the New Testament. He usually begins with the words, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, or something very similar. But here in Galatians, he begins, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul makes it very clear to the readers of the letter where his authority comes from. He doesn't make such a big deal of this in his other letters because it's not an issue in the other letters. But as we've already mentioned, Paul's credibility is being questioned in these churches. So Paul wastes no time establishing his credentials. He is an apostle with a capital A, called and appointed, not by any human being or human institution, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Well, what's an apostle? The word apostle means sent one, but as with many words, this word carries far more meaning 
than that in the way that it's used here by Paul and other places in the New Testament. An apostle, with a capital A, refers to a special group of men who had been chosen and given the responsibility by Jesus Christ himself to establish and lead the church in its earliest days. These men had the authority of Jesus Christ. What they said and wrote when serving as apostles was considered the word of Jesus. The writings of the apostles are in our Bible and considered holy scripture. You'll sometimes hear the term apostolic age. It refers to the time in the early days of the church when it was led by the apostles, such as Paul, Peter, John, James. A question that is sometimes asked is if there are apostles in our own day. There are no more apostles with a capital A. They all passed away in the first generation of the church. There may be people in our own day who some consider apostles with a little a. These would be people with an unusual leadership gift, responsible for establishing and leading churches on a large scale. I personally think we're best served by being very cautious in using the term apostle outside the context of the New Testament. In fact, anyone who takes and uses the title of apostle for themselves in our own day is immediately put on my personal watch list of potential cult leaders, kooks, and crooks. They might be legit, but I'm keeping my eye on them. Just saying. You would do well to do the same. In his opening greeting, Paul mentions all the brothers who are with him. The point he's making is that the gospel that he has taught the Galatian believers and is defending in this letter is the same gospel that other churches are believing too. Although the gospel of Jesus Christ is unique among religions in general, it is a truth held in common among all true churches of Jesus Christ. The implication being that if a so-called church holds to and teaches a different gospel, then they're not really a true church of Jesus Christ. Verse 3 he continues, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul extends a greeting and blessing to the people reading the letter, which he does in all of his letters, but he does something else here too which I don't want us to miss. He manages to squeeze in to his greeting the gospel message before he even gets to the body of the letter. And this is by design, being that he's dealing with the problems in these churches. Look at what he manages to squeeze in here. He says, the Lord Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, Jesus gave up his life for our lives. He traded places with us. The punishment that should have been borne by us was borne by Jesus on our behalf. Through the sacrificial death of Jesus for our sins, that debt was paid. We are now forgiven. His death has brought us life. Then he says, to deliver us from the present evil age. Jesus has delivered us, saved us, rescued us from this present realm or age that's under the dominion of evil and characterized by death, having no future or hope. And Jesus has brought us into his kingdom, his age, which is dominated and characterized by life and goodness. The gospel of Jesus is not about morality. It is the great story of rescue, the story of rescuing humanity from the age of sin and death. 
That's the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is the great story of rescue. And then he says, according to the will of our God, our rescue, our salvation, and all that Jesus Christ has done for us has been according to the will of God. In other words, it wasn't our idea to save us. It was God's idea. It was his plan, his will, his purpose, his desire. And it was accomplished by him rather than us. He took the initiative to do for us what we didn't even know we needed done. In the gospel, there's no weak link present for the salvation of humanity. Our salvation is by God alone. And that means our salvation chain won't break. Our salvation is a sure thing. We have a real hope that will really be fulfilled. You see, religion is a sucker punch. It promises a new life, but it isn't able to deliver a new life because the obtaining of that new life is ultimately up to you. It says if you work hard enough and long enough, you can have the new life. But none of us, none of us are able to work hard enough and long enough to obtain that new life. None of us can be good enough, long enough to get the new life. In the gospel, a new life has been obtained for you through the work of Jesus Christ. By believing this to be true, you get the new life. The new life is yours. He says, according to the will of our God and our Father. This single word, Father, speaks of this new relationship that we have with God through the gospel of Christ. See, we are no longer the broken, damaged remains of a rebellious creation under the judgment of God. Instead, we are sons and daughters of the creator, king of the universe, having been brought to life spiritually, and we are awaiting our full transformation into the likeness of Jesus. Maybe I should repeat that. We're no longer the broken, damaged remains of a rebellious creation under the judgment of God. We are instead sons and daughters of the creator, king of the universe, having been brought to life spiritually and are awaiting our full transformation into the likeness of Jesus. And he finishes by saying, to whom be the glory forever and ever. All of the responsibility, all of the responsibility for our salvation was taken on by God. And all the credit, therefore, also goes to God for our salvation. All the glory goes to him. Now, this is both humbling and freeing for us. By nature, we want to be our own savior. But as hard as it might be to accept this truth, we are the weak link. If we insert ourselves into the system for our salvation, then the system becomes as weak as its weakest part. And that weakest part is a selfish, mortal, finite, broken being that has trouble keeping his dentist appointment much less not being able to rescue himself from sin and death. It is a freeing thing to know that in the gospel we are not the weak link in the system of our salvation. Because we're not in it at all. This system is sound. It's dependent upon the infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing perfect one who gave himself for us. 
John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And now we understand better what Paul means with his opening words of verse 3 when he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the normal greeting of the day in Greek culture would have used the verb forms of grace and peace. But in the gospel, grace and peace are nouns. And he uses the noun forms here. Grace and peace are not actions that we do but things that we have been given. Grace encapsulates the gospel. Grace is the very foundation upon which our relationship with God is built and carried out. Our relationship with God is not something that is earned by us. It's not a reward for being a good boy or good girl. It is given to us through Jesus and to be experienced by us through Jesus. Peace is the result of the grace-motivated gospel of Christ. We now have peace with God. We have peace within. We have peace with each other. Verse 6. He now begins to move into the content of his letter. He says, I am astonished... You, that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Paul says, I'm astonished. I'm amazed. I'm shocked. He's shocked that the people of these churches are so quickly turning away from the gospel of Jesus, which he has taught them, to another gospel. He's astonished for two reasons. First, the speed at which they have turned from what he taught them is shocking. A little more than a year has passed since Paul founded these churches and they are already going off the rails. Second, the gospel that they are trading for the re- for the true gospel, for the real gospel that Paul taught them is shocking because they are exchanging diamonds for dirt. They're exchanging something of priceless value for something that is completely worthless. They're exchanging this amazing salvation that God has accomplished for us, which we have spent some time talking about already, for the same useless religious ideas and approaches that have never and can never save anyone. And why can't these religions save us? Because they all have the weak link in them. They all depend on us getting it together and holding it together in some way. Martin Luther wrote in his commentary on Galatians, there is no middle ground between Christian righteousness and works righteousness. There's no other alternative to Christian righteousness but works righteousness. If you do not build your confidence on the work of Christ, you must build your confidence on your own work. And we know what it means when we build our confidence on our own work. It means the weak link has been introduced into the perfect work of Jesus Christ. 
adding anything, Paul says, adding anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ makes it something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is no longer the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. If we begin to practice a form of Christianity that adds anything to the grace of God for obtaining our salvation, then we have swapped out the real gospel for something that is no gospel at all. We have exchanged what is of priceless value for something that is completely worthless. We have traded real salvation for no salvation. And when we see this issue in these terms, that we're trading real salvation for no salvation, then we begin to understand why Paul is so lit up about these, small, these false teachers saying what he says in verses 8 and 9, that they should be accursed, eternally condemned, because these false teachers are robbing people of real salvation. He says, even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a different gospel, let him be accursed, eternally condemned under God's wrathful, eternal judgment. Notice that Paul even includes himself here. Even if I, Paul, teach you a different way of salvation other than by the grace of God alone through faith in Christ alone, then let me be eternally cursed. Is it important that the gospel of Jesus Christ not be messed with? You better believe it. The eternal destiny of people are at stake. The glory of God is at stake. The significance and importance of the death of Jesus are at stake. There's only one true gospel, one true message of good news from God to humanity. Anything else is not good news, it's bad news. That's what Paul says. In closing this morning, you don't want to be the weak link in your salvation. You don't want to be the weak link in your salvation. Trust entirely in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you and continues to do for you to rescue you from sin and death, to, to, to create his new life in you and to give you eternal life with him in heaven. Live in the freedom and the peace and the security of the gospel of Jesus. Know that you're God's child. Know that the new life of Christ is in you. Know that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Know that he's producing in you, the character of Jesus, as you walk with him. Know that you are already part of the heavenly realm. And one day you will fully embrace and enter in when he calls you home. The gospel gives you this new life. So here's the last thing. If you're thinking that it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as you are a loving and good person, then you're relying on a weak link for your salvation system, and that weak link is you. If you're thinking that it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as you are a loving and good person, then you're relying on a weak link for your salvation, and that weak link is you. You need to know. You need to know that what you're believing and trusting in is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's something else. And that something else is going to break. It's going to fail. It will not hold up it is going to fall short because it depends ultimately on you. I implore you 
to leave all of that behind and take hold of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Trust in him alone for your salvation. He has a new life that he wants to give you. I don't even understand why human beings are determined to keep leaving themselves in the loop. We are the weak link. We cannot carry our salvation. Get out of the loop, man. Embrace Christ. Let's flip over to Romans 10 and read one passage in closing. I want you to know that what Paul writes in Galatians is not unique. He told the same thing to all the churches because this is what Jesus told him to tell all the churches. Romans 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray that somehow through the inadequacy of this human being, you have and do and continue to communicate your gospel, your good news to humanity, the gospel of Jesus, and that we take hold of this amazing good news, Lord, that our salvation comes through the grace of God alone, through faith in Jesus alone. I pray in particular for those here this morning who are not trusting Christ up to this point. They think, as long as I'm a good person and keep myself out of trouble, it doesn't matter what I believe. It matters what we believe. Because God became a human being and dwelt among us and died for our sins and came back to life on the third day. And all who trust in him will be saved. I pray that they will trust you today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.